I'm Drew Stevenson, and this is a video from my administrative law class about the case Jarkissi versus the Securities and Exchange Commission. This was a case from the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals in 2022 about the constitutionality of Securities and Exchange Commission administrative law judges. Now, I want to say something for my students really quickly. Um, this case brings up some issues that we cover at different points in our administrative law course, the non-delegation doctrine, presidential appointment and removal powers, and also something called the public rights doctrine. Um, in theory, I could talk about the case at any one of those points in the course. I'm probably going to uh, teach it or have you watch this video when we're doing presidential removal powers. The United States Supreme Court has granted cert in this case and is going to be um, uh, considering it this term. So stay tuned. Um, we'll have to see what the court does. This opinion, by the way, is um, uh, very confusing to read, and it's definitely a break from uh, from longstanding precedent in administrative law on a number of issues, as we're going to see. So maybe this is going to mark a completely new direction for how the courts treat agencies and ALJs, or maybe the Supreme Court will uh, sort of rein in what the Fifth Circuit did here. So let's go back and look at what happens in this case. And I'm going to start with the main takeaway, in case you give up on me, that anything with securities law can get a little complicated and boring. Um, but the, basically, the Fifth Circuit held it was unconstitutional for an administrative law judge to decide this type of securities fraud case, um, even if the parties had the option of seeking judicial review of that ALJ's decision in a court afterwards. Um, and so that's a big break from longstanding precedent. And the Fifth Circuit gave three independent reasons uh, for this. First, the right to a jury trial. So the Constitution guarantees a right to a jury trial. I'll come back to that in a moment. They said that the um, arrangement with the ALJs um, and the SEC violates the non-delegation doctrine. And um, third, that the ALJs themselves, because they're immune from direct removal, um, at will, they're not at will employees of the president, that it violates the Constitution's uh, framework for presidential removal powers. Now, let's meet our cast of characters. Jarkissi um, is an investor uh, and a kind of a financial advisor type person and a conservative pundit, a populist conservative pundit. So he has a radio show or and a podcast, uh, I think, and um, does spots on Fox News. And uh, uh, 10 or 12 years ago, there was there were these rallies called tea parties, t um, taxed enough already parties. There were basically kind of pop conservative populist uh, political rallies where they would have speakers come in and um, uh, criticize uh, government overreach and how much uh, the tax burden and things like that. And his main claim to fame, whenever he was handed the microphone at one of these rallies, as one pictured here was he claimed to be the first public figure to call President Obama a communist publicly. Um, and um, But what is more important for our case is that he started two hedge funds around that time and raised $30 million from investors. Uh, in 2011, the SEC charged Jarkissi, his firm, and a related investment firm, Patriot 28 LLC, with deceiving and defrauding investors by inflating the value of the fund's assets, which um, by overstating or uh, causing an artif artificial bump in the assets, increased his management and investment fees. So he profited off of this uh, sort of stunt. The SEC also found that he had lied about the identity of the fund's auditor to the investors and the, its prime broker, and about his own role, personal role, in making investment decisions. Um, the director of the SEC's New York regional office at the time was Andrew Calamari, and uh, here's his take on the case. Jarkissi disregarded the basic standards to which all fund managers are held. Not only did he falsify valuations and deceive investors about the value of their holdings, but he bent over backwards to enrich his partner Belasis at the fund's expense. Now, when they brought this enforcement action, the SEC found that Jarkissi had used the fund's assets 
basically had taken money uh, from that the investors had put in and used that to hire stock promoters in 2010, 2011 to create an artificial and unsustainable um, bump or spike in the price of two microcap stocks in which he had shifted all of the funds uh, or a lot of the funds investments or, or holdings. Um, so the funds re therefore recorded temporary gains in the value of their holdings, their stock holdings, which Jarkissi then used to mask the fact that he was getting um, incurring substantial losses on other fund assets with lower value or the write down of other fund assets with lower values. So when um, he's uh, kind of uh, brought to justice, let's say, um, before an ALJ, he challenged the constitutionality of the tribunal itself. He said that the ALJ had no right to adjudicate the case. Um, by the way, the ALJ in this case was Carol, Carol Fox uh, Folak, who was one of the most experienced um, administrative law judges in, um, in the Securities and Exchange Commission. They have four or five administrative law judges for that agency, and she had decades of experience, was, is a highly regarded um, expert in securities uh, law. But the Fifth Circuit held that it violated Jarkissi's Seventh Amendment right to a jury trial because the ALJ in this case imposed civil penalties on him. And so now this case has come up before um, this issue, I'm sorry, in cases about the public rights doctrine. If you're uh, in my course, uh, we haven't gotten to that yet when we're doing presidential powers, but we will. And, um, and basically uh, there was a line of cases mostly based on the bankruptcy courts um, that the court here, the Fifth Circuit, relies on, Judge Elrod's opinion. Um, the court held that if a case involves civil fines um, or is based on alleged fraud, which um, because that was a common law uh, um, doctrine, even before the Constitution was ratified, the Congress could not entrust adjudication of such claims to an administrative law judge instead of an Article III court, where the defendant would have a right to a jury trial. In other words, it's pretty clear that the statute gives this power to the administrative law judge and gives the SEC discretion to bring the case before an ALJ instead of an Article III court. But the opinion says that because we had um, a, a civil fraud at common law, that has to be done before an, a traditional Article III court. Um, now, to give a little bit of background about what's really going on, in case you're wondering what what is going on here, um, there are a number of outspoken critics, uh, as you know, of the regulatory state, um, people who don't like regulation or believe that um, any regulation is government overreach or a limitation on our freedoms, um, and they would like to see agencies um, not exist or do a lot less. So critics, these critics of the administrative state um, also have a prevailing view, the, the legal thinkers in this area, that defendants will fare better with juries. They assume that um, administrative law judges in general, and especially with the SEC, are biased towards the agency. So for example, the Wall Street Journal has basically um, uh, taken this position in some of its uh, editorials, that the SEC ALJs are really biased against defendants and that if a defendant had a, a jury before a trial of their peers, that they would do better. Um, this is not true. In fact, the, um, the, in 2017, a uh, researcher did a large-scale empirical study of the outcomes of the cases in a comparison to the ones that where a jury did get to decide the case versus an ALJ and found that there was little or no difference in the outcome. So it, it, it's hard to shake people of something or disabuse them of a notion that they've latched onto that, oh, an, uh, an agency ALJ must be biased towards the agency, but that's actually often not the case. Now, let's go back to the opinion here. The majority's opinion uh, seems to contradict the um, CFTC v. Shore. This is a public rights doctrine case. Um, although that case was about pendant or ancillary jurisdiction and jer jerkacy is not. Um, it's really about the constitutionality of the ALJs. But the expansive language of the opinion seems to narrow 
the public rights doctrine, uh, that in other words, the range of cases that an agency ALJ can adjudicate significantly and basically limits it to cases that are purely public rights with no common law analog. That's not the same test that the Supreme Court set forth in CFTC v. Shore back in the 80s. The Fifth Circuit also held that the statute, at least as amended under the Dodd-Frank Act, um, violated the non-delegation doctrine because it had no intelligible principle for the agency's discretion or choice about whether to bring securities fraud cases before an ALJ or directly into court. Now note that, remember that this administrative law hearing was a decade ago, was back in the Obama era. Um, since the Supreme Court's decision in Lucia in that case, um, during the, the Trump years, the SEC has basically been just going to court. So when they bring in an enforcement action, their, their practice now is to go directly into federal district court, in which case a defendant may have the right to a jury trial. Um, but the statute does give them sort of the choice uh, about whether to do an ALJ, use an, uh, start uh, with an ALJ first, or to go directly into court. Now, um, a careful or narrow reading of the opinion would confine this non-delegation issue to a single provision in the Dodd-Frank Act, um, which basically expanded the SEC's discretion about venue selection for enforcement cases. But the majority does not say we're narrowing our holding or this only applies to this. Um, they don't emphasize the narrowness of their holding. Instead, they use soaring rhetoric, grandiose rhetoric about the importance of juries, lots and lots of quotes from the founding fathers and the Federalist Papers. Um, and uh, while choice of venue is arguably normally a matter of uh, prosecutorial discretion or a typical power of the executive branch, the court here insists that this is a legislative choice. And I find that very specific point really confusing. I think that this is a question about where um, an enforcement agency that's, cl that's clearly an executive function, um, how they want to proceed with their enforcement action if they want to kind of vet it within the agency first and have an, a neutral um, adjudicator uh, consider all the evidence before, they, before the case goes to court or not. Um, but the court, Fifth Circuit says that this is a legislative choice. And as far as I can tell, by this logic, every specific step in enforcement or even in promulgating a regulation or code uh, could be an impermissible delegation under this. This is sort of a new twist on the non-delegation doctrine to apply it to one small type of decision that an agency can make. Um, and the court's expansive language seems to say that any legislative decision cannot be delegated without an independent in intelligible principle um, uh, packed into the statute. And so this allows for future non-delegation challenges on a really granular level uh, for decisions made at each step in the process of enforcement or rulemaking. Now, the third holding of the opinion is that the ALJs uh, violate the Constitution's provision of presidential removal power because the ALJs are under uh, the Merit Service Protection Board. Uh, in other words, they have four cause removal only and presumably would be removed um, if they were uh, out of line, um, neglect of duty or a dereliction of duty, misconduct, by, they would be removed by the SEC commissioners, not fired by the president. The court says that this is two-layer protection violating the Free Enterprise Fund case. The problem is that all the civil service members um, are under the Merit Service Protection Board and the president cannot directly fire them, um, but the majority's reasoning would seem to apply to everybody at the SEC, even the lowest level employees, and really any other administrative agency, independent agency. To me, honestly, this seems like a backdoor way to allow the president, um, the, give the president much greater power to, to basically purge the entire federal government, um, uh, uh, the st all, replace all the staff at agencies like the SEC or the Federal Trade Commission or even the Merit Service Protection Board um, with people that are loyal to the president and um, and thereby thwart a commissioner board's ability to do anything that the contradicts what the president wants you know on a given day or a given month 
So in other words, all the staff um, at an agency, in, in theory, and if you take this case seriously, would be at risk of being fired if they do anything that the president doesn't like or that the president perceives as dis personally disloyal. Um, now, the majority says that only the multi-member bipartisan commissions themselves, in other words, the top people at the agency can have for cause protection from political firing, going back to th uh, cases like Humphrey's executor. Now, to me, this also seems to be in tension with Morrison v. Olson, um, although um, it's not mentioned in this case anywhere. Ne neither the majority nor the dissent discuss Morrison very much. Um, the in independent counsel in Morrison, you may remember, uh, was removable only by the attorney general. The whole point was to protect the individual from removal by the president. And back then, the Supreme Court upheld this arrangement for an inferior officer. It would seem, though, under the the Fifth Circuit's version of two layers of review or their sort of expansion of the Free Enterprise Fund case, that Morrison v. Olson might no longer be valid either. And that concludes our discussion about Jarkissi versus the SEC. Remember that this case is going to be decided by the Supreme Court this term, and I'll probably have to redo this video, and we'll have to see if the Supreme Court um, reverses the Fifth Circuit or affirms them on one small point, or, um, or if we get a sort of a sea change in administrative law because of this case.